I see the sun's bright smile and listen to the sweet song of the birds. At the beginning of summer, nature lifts my heart. I am hopeful that our attitudes can change and both mountain and river can enjoy freedom and solace again. So, Sergeant, can I hit you with you? I want to introduce our first 
number of poets. So we're going to have Sarah Voice, Colin McGill of Ian, and Saf O'Malley, Neil Wellman, Bill of the Saf. So for anybody who doesn't know Shafira, she's a brilliant singer, she's a brilliant poet, she's a brilliant activist, she's a brilliant policy worker for PPR, and she's done some other things, but amongst her many talents is her, her poetry. So while I love the Bill of Bustle, we're sort of I'm not sure of all those things, but one thing I'm not proud of is good at uh, negotiating an agreement or a deal. Because if we learned anything in the last 21 years, it's all in the, in the interpretation. And I don't remember me agreeing to say I would go on first. And it. Just, uh, you read your poem, because it's a brilliant poem, so for a while I get to share it all. So in Kid Ken Tashe uh So Kid Ken this first one I'm gonna read is called The Devil's Rope. And just a little bit about where it came from and people probably remember this. At one stage last year, Donald Trump was talking about uh, the barbed wire that they're putting up and uh, he made this comment. They said that barbed wire used properly can be a thing of beauty. So I just thought it was the most shocking thing <laughs> among the many shocking things that, that that man has come out with. But it just got me thinking about barbed wire and where barbed wire has come from and this idea that it could ever, ever be a thing of beauty. So, scream and shout. So, the devil's rope Lighter than air, stronger than whiskey, cheaper than dust. In the drifts of winter, hollowed out cattle, hunger driven, range towards southern plains. Hides toughened by thorn bushes were skewered by steel barbs, tattered like native prayer flags that caught the direction of the wind, the first fray in an endless fence cutting war. Lighter than air, stronger than whiskey cheaper than dust. Once this deadly coil was sprung, it snaked across the Gulf Stream, a million miles of barbarity unfurled on Flanders fields, night after deafening night, ground was silently staked, as mallets and blankets muffled the sound of wiring parties unspooling, yard by senseless yard, across no man's land. Lighter than air, stronger than whiskey, cheaper than dust. That piercing image of twitching men amongst its brambles impaled itself on every map. Don't fence me in, that gentler hook in Porter's lullaby, Wagner's Valkyries, electrifying the camp's wire, unimaginable sounds as hollowed out prisoners embraced the fence. Lighter than air, stronger than whiskey, cheaper than dust. A swollen tributary flows into the Rio Grande, Caravans of human hope clamber up its muddy banks as coil after zinc coil waits to be unrolled, waits for the drum roll, that signal for soldiers to go hog wild again with hammers. An infinity of wire and wood galvanizes the grass, children's faces stream as tear gas drowns their eyes, while panic parents hurl hand woven haraches against concertina wire. Lighter than air, stronger than whiskey, cheaper than dust. The plains Apache give their own name for this invasive species, the devil's rope. Without soil or water, it stalks the earth and entangles us all. Good name. Just to say that. That's not the refrain that, that, that repeated it, lighter than air, stronger than whiskey, cheaper than dust. That was when it was marketed first to the guy who um, invented it, and given it, a guy called Glidden. Uh, Claire made me look this up because he said to me with an error, he said, who invented it again? Yeah. I remember the time. So I had to go off and research it all again. Some guy, Glidden, back in the 1860s, got the patent. It was a guy before him, but this guy from Illinois um, sort of got the patent for it. And that's how he marketed it. That was his sort of selling thing, lighter than air, stronger than whiskey, um, or cheaper than, than dust. Okay, so Chuck Canella, um, and again, this is 
the Golden of People might know um, by Patrick Pierce, um, the rebel. Um, we are the risen people. Beware of the thing that is coming. So I call this one the thing that is coming. We are the risen people, grasping at the demigods of this new dispensation, of nail bars and vaping shops, of all day bur- of all day breakfast joints and all night burger bars, of empty litter bins dotted along litter strewn streets, of fuck you driving and fuck you parking, of ice store stanchions with panoptic views, of higgledy piggledy shops selling bread and papers, their purview panning to turbocharged shopping trolleys bung with economies of scale, tipping calves and heels and corner shopkeepers with the latest loss leaders. Mothers being sold to make a quick buck, and us, their children, we have no treasure but crook. Beware, we are an alien people, grasping at all we can get. So, and this one uh, is called Sniper's Alley. I was thinking uh, quite a lot recently the stuff that's coming out in the Fail and Bubble this year, the, the Cribby, uh, the Cribby competition. And the, uh, so, here, what's it called? Cribby. 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 Well, I'll start that now. Cribby. 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 We all agree it's called Cribby. <laughs> the purpose is. Okay, so, the Sniper's Alley. It was where we played cribby and shot at soldiers who platooned straight into our path. Football boots swung from wrists, gun belts slung across hips, all laces and leather, invincible. Older folk minded house, hauled kids out of alleys, into running clubs, summer jobs, caravans in Donegal. They fretted lace curtains, rubbed rosary beads, distracted. Back in Sniper's Alley, dribbling that ball and dodging bullets, cool clobber replaced by rainproof jackets, sensible shoes, foreboding. We open envelopes, unfold our fears, ring the calendar and run the gauntlet of blood tests, MRIs, CAT scans, X-rays, forewarnings. We engage in decoy runs, blank out the state of play, decamp to mobile homes, buffeted by headwinds, to brace ourselves for the next volley, exposed. We keep on playing the ball, throwing it out and claiming every bounce back. Before we go on to the next reader, does anybody here want to hear Sarah singing a song? Yeah. Is it singing a song? Come on, Sarah. Come on. Okay, our next our next reader uh, again is a contributor to the evening that we've had in here. It's a guy called Colin McGillivan or Colin Bansted. Colin has been working for the last 10 or 15 years campaigning for truth or for justice for those who are the victims of killers. And they wrote some amazing stuff. And Colin is going to come up and share two of his big poems with us. Phil Buster Colin. Refugees loving on our shore, hammering on the rich man's door, past Kyoto, Paris, and all the rest, the ones in Davos doing their best. They can't pretend they didn't know the way that things were bound to come. Their avarice they couldn't check, they made their fortunes on the back of environmental devastation, the rape and plundering of nations. Fossil fuels, deforestation, no need for an Einstein to do the equation. 
Let's go Brewers all around, but they were oblivious to the sound. The warnings of impending doom, the fact that it was coming soon. They mined and drilled and hacked away with no concern for posterity. They missed their own fake targets and didn't care. Their mantra, grow the economy, classic bird. Like the humanity's poor look on and despair, watch grazing seas and dried up rivers, look to their political leaders to deliver, and answer to their anguish cries, but all the way back were empty lives. In the pockets of the bankers, them and all the other gangsters, obey the markets as we must, but the markets are just good and bust. Another giant roulette table for the willing and the able. For them, the circle came of chance. We pay the bill, they keep the ranch. The, CEO, the CEOs said CO2s should not bother you or me. The answer lay in technology, proclaimed the captains of industry, to deliver us from all our ills a silver bullet and we're able to help. If it should fail to materialize, worry not, dry your eyes. Someone else will put the bill, copy us, and learn to chill. The G7 has had their say, Bangladesh will be made to pay. They have made a wasteland of the earth as we continue to give birth. Nine billion souls in rising, this boat we're in is fast capsizing. The present. It doesn't have to be this way, we can plan and work for a better day. We really only have one choice, give off your needs and find your voice. <clears throat> when we get flashbacks of the scenes on our television screens, of starvation in the air, malnutrition everywhere, instead of existential fear that seem to have created, we must make it very clear by our actions and our deeds that we will put an end to greed, our compulsion to consume, manufacture or organic, from the bottom to the top, we are prepared to make it stop. Our finite resources we must share, but we are truly sincere when we say we care about the welfare of the human race and the rest of the creatures who inhabit this place. The rewards are great, as you will see, if we protect the world and its biodiversity. We can live our lives with less, with less anxiety and build a meaningful society. But you don't have to listen to me, do the math, and you will see. We can't continue to grow our economy based on an artificial need to satisfy our reckless greed. Live in a shared, sustainable world, and we will prosper. Everyone must play their part, follow your way, open your heart. Now, take this poem, laugh it away, don't let it see the light of day. In 2050, take it out and see what's become of humanity. <laughs> <laughs> this next poem is called Nagging My Group. Uh, and it's, it's about three victims uh, you can prove in the present conflict, and one back in 1922. Uh, and I know we may all be a little bit smart, very small community and whatever, so uh, before I read this, I would like to say if there is anybody related to any of the people in this, right, it's not my attention to be upset anyone. Uh, so, you know, just like that. So, uh, also within this, it, it, one of the victims was a guy called Brian McGuire. Uh, it was reported at the time in, uh, in 1978 that he was found hung uh, in a cell at the Castle Interrogation Center. Uh, later at, at, at the trial of UDA Mon, this UDA Mon stated that he himself was actually uh, in Castaway at the same time as the special branch told him that it was they who had uh, uh, killed Bram McGuire. And they said that they effectively had done it because Bram McGuire had been in uh, the question following uh, uh, the killing of uh, an RUC man. <coughs> anyway, so it's in memory of. Uh, uh, Jackie McMahon, aged 18, murdered on the 18th of the 1st, 1978. Brian McGuire, 27, <coughs> murdered on the 10th of the 5th, 1978. James O'Hare, 34, murdered on the 25th of the 5th, 1922. January 1978, the UBS and Sumi were hit. Blackie and others lay in wait on the Lagenbank Road by the mortuary gate for half a stage to meet their fate. 
Along came Jackie with two of his mates, took off running, but for Jackie, too late. He fell into the hands of the RUC. They released him, they said, around about three. Walking home, alone now, in the wee small hours, not sitting about to hear a scream or a shout. At a UDR checkpoint, pulled into the side, feeling and scum tossed into the pay. The wagon took him in its tight embrace, planted cold wet kisses on his face, swept him away from that fall awful place for months on end without a trace. His body washed up at the mouth of the law by the fact that where his father worked. <laughs> Across town in Castle Ray, Brian McGuire hanged himself to the very same day. At least that's what the special grounds say. But not before boasting to the UDA, we did it, we made him pay. Yet in all their statements to this very day, at their own hand, the wife of them said, Jackie left behind an empty space while those who loved him somehow found the place. Not to give up on the human race, but work hard and strove to build a better place. You not find his name and his victim's book, the powers to be refused to look. In all of this, there's nothing new for Belfast Tales, right? It's me and you. Long before 1921, the fun had well and truly begun. When you chose to kill a pig, no need to dig a grave. Like James O'Hare, you hoist him in the air, to loud and hateful cheer, the last sound to reach his ears. Ignore his desperation, his despair, as he dangles in the air, and you fuck him in the pay. You've no need to run or hide, no one's coming after you. Sure, he only half what he was due. The wagon took him in his head and raised, planted cold wet kisses on his face. He's laying his eye right to the trace. and shake off shackles and every. And do as she is with Dovis in Maine of Baltimore, as budding bluebells break through the ground above the hatchet, and bites fully hang their heads to look out over much of their fortune. The mountain cradles out their cloony and breathes life into the busy. Mahamud's spoken you and Yari are our gossa, are our bracken, are our tree. Thank you, Liam. So we're going to take a wee, a wee uh, digression here, and we're going to ask uh, for a, a Belfast native who's supposed to be from Kalamara originally, but is now part of the Belfast Heel Football, to come up uh, and do what we said. If anybody doesn't know Adele Farrings, is a multi-talented community activist who does stuff on radio, she makes TV programs, and in her spare time, she plays a bit of music. So Adele is going to come up and share some of her, 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 her tunes, some tunes she has learned at home, and written her set herself. So we'll have us all over Adele. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so 
I wrote some tunes for this, but the problem with traditional music is that when you think you've written it, sometimes it's already a tune. So, <laughs> if, if that is the case, I apologize. <laughs> right. We so don't even have names yet, so we'll see how they go. With them. So the first one is out of jigs. John was laughing because he knows that somebody's got written written today. <laughs>
So this is a period of time in the aftermath of losing a lot of siblings to the streets, to poverty, violence, the drug trade in South Boston, where I was growing up. On top of that, a code of silence that didn't allow you to talk about this stuff, that didn't allow you to have a voice. So for me, it's a pleasure to read this in this place, which is about as I, when I, Stephen Murphy and I were coming tonight, I was telling him this is really the center of the incredibly powerful Irish language rights movement. And as such, it's really the center of, the Patrick Dean, I know you'll, uh, you'll um, appreciate me saying this, it's really the center of civil rights in the six counties, this place. I think it's where a lot of it's emanating out of, and intersecting with a lot of other rights groups. And that really is about voice and agency. And coming from a lot of trauma, I know a lot of people in this room will relate to a lot of things that exist in this passage, having grown up in this area um, throughout the war. So, What's amazing for me is to see how DIY this community is, how uh, people in this place that I've gotten to know pretty well, how, how people in this place have taken some really horrific stuff, some atrocities, and transformed it. So the piece I'm gonna read might be a dark piece, but, spoiler alert, I <laughs> spoiler alert, I found my voice, I became an activist, I became an organizer. So, um, but this is a period of time before that, before I was able to ever find out how you take really painful, difficult stuff and transform it into your voice in the world. So in the aftermath of losing a lot of siblings and a lot of neighbors dropping left and right all around me in the community I grew up in, uh, South Boston, a neighborhood that held the highest concentration of white poverty in America, a neighborhood with 75% single-parent female-headed households, a really vulnerable population that was then preyed upon by not only Whitey Bulger and gangsters that ran the place, but also in collusion, familiar word, right? In collusion with uh, state agents uh, who he was working alongside. So incredibly powerful force, the gangsters in collusion with the government, uh, preying upon an incredibly vulnerable community. And this is in the aftermath of Losing uh, a lot of people in the neighborhood, but having no way to put that stuff, having no way to say anything about it or talk about it. So that's why since then, uh, really everything I'm involved in now is about um, sharing that notion of people finding their voice through their traumas, through their difficulties. And we've heard a lot of that tonight. Thank you for the readings tonight where we hear that stuff. Um, and the music too, because really the music is about that for a lot of people as well, for finding their voice through a lot of difficult stuff. People's callings in their lives, people's work, the work they do, whether teachers or so forth, really oftentimes is about working with some of the most difficult aspects of their life and turning it into a gift, basically. So my latest symptoms as a teenager was heavy head. I kept coming up with symptoms and I run around to emergency rooms all over the city of Boston to the point where they were starting to hide from me. The doctors were telling the nurses, tell them I'm not here. <clears throat> it was all I could do to carry my heavy head up Joy Street. 
Resting at a stoop on the way up Beacon Hill, I wondered if making the appointment had been the right thing to do. After all the symptoms I've had came back, along with some new ones, I give in to the idea of seeing the therapist. Doctors were still avoiding me, and of course I couldn't talk to my family about my impending death. I thought that I could maybe get the therapist to help convince the doctors that I wasn't crazy and should be taken seriously for once. From the foot of Joy Street, the hill looked steep. I felt like one of the older people I saw, stopping to hold on to every railing they came to. <clears throat> the therapist watched me as I tried to answer her question, only her third in what seemed like small talk to get acquainted with. Shit, here we go again, I thought. All my life I had struggled with the answer to the question, how many are in your family, and it wasn't getting any easier. <coughs> My mother had lost the baby Patrick a year before I was born. We always included him in the count, since we thought of him as a kind of guardian sibling. As a child, sometimes I would say, 11 but one died. People would ask, shocked, 11 brothers and sisters? I was proud to be from such a big family. Only the Roonies and the Newmans had more. 11 living kids, even me by one. The Roonies got the most shocked responses, all 11 being boys, so it was best not to be around any Roonies when the questions came up. Once I started spending time beyond Southie, though, my 11 would throw people for a loop. They'd make the same old joke about Irish Catholics and rabbits. After David died, I started saying 11 would 2 died, but then people exclaimed, oh my god, I wanted to know how the two would die. Once I saw how people recoiled at the mention of someone jumping off a roof, I usually didn't feel like talking about it. I learned to say nine, believed to have to deal only with the Irish Catholics for a little But I felt guilty about cutting David out of the count, even though I no longer cared about childish birth rate contents. I started including both Davy and Patrick again. But now with Frankie and Kevin dead, and only seven of us remaining alive, I'd answer a few times 11 before died, only to see the person on the car side, not wanting to ask how. Then to comfort them, I'd explain that it wasn't that bad. That only the three of them. Patrick was a baby who died before I was born, which only made their faces contort more. I had to do some quick math in my head before answering at all these days, since my sister Kathy was now permanently brain damaged and increasingly schizophrenic. Kathy had been thrown off her roof and I had to fight off the pills and was in a coma for five months. She talked to herself all, all day now and wrote childhood rhymes on any piece of paper she could find. An existence that seemed somewhere between life and death. I felt like I was one of six, not seven survivors, and that brought me back to thinking, who's next? Then I'd want to call home to make sure everyone was okay, or wonder whether the strange feeling in my throat was cancer. I only paused for a few seconds before giving my 11 before died version, but the therapist looked confused. She straightened up in her chair to pursue the question further. How did they die? She asked straightforward. I was glad she wasn't asking with the why dies that usually come to the question. Anytime Ma had to answer the question, she said they were in a car accident. I guess Ma wanted to keep it simple, rather than getting into suicide, jumps and falls from rooftops, bank robberies, and prison deaths. And she would never talk about the night she lost her baby, Patrick. But a car accident? Try, tired of Grandpa's admonishing that I should say nothing to nobody, I was saddened by Ma's shame about the ways my brothers had died. Ma was the one who had always gone against the hush hush Irish ways of her parents. Okay, here goes, I thought. Remember Patrick, even though you never met him, and keep Kathy off the list of dead. I opened my left thumb to remember that Kathy was not dead and opened my right hand fingers to keep the count of the four. I started with the baby, Patrick, Patrick Michael, who died of pneumonia, just to be done with that story. I received his name in reverse, I said, glad to begin with a less tragic fact before telling about the baby being denied access to the hospital. There, that's done with, I thought, closing one finger and leaving three open. The therapist, her face somber, looked like she was really listening. The hospitals didn't have to take welfare babies back then, I said. Changing the subject from Ma's banging on neighbor's doors with the baby already dead in her arms, which was still lingering the therapist's face. Before Medicaid, I added, when she looked surprised at wealthy babies being turned away. Then I tried to turn the conversation to how Reagan wanted to go back to those days. I guess I was trying to figure out whether she was a Republican, in which case every reason had never come back. But she didn't give away much about herself. What about the other ones, she asked. Huh? Did the others who died? Oh, um, well, Davey jumped off the roof and killed himself. But he's mentally ill. He got a breakdown when he was 14. I know he must have really wanted to go, though, because he put up a fight against the EMTs who tried to save him. So it's okay, I figured, but he did. She said nothing during my pause. Suicide, I mean, I said, interrupting the silence. You know how they say they're going to hell? I know he must have been in a lot of pain every single day, but we've done that. 
added, he died nine hours later, I'm not sure what else to write in the face of her searching stare. The therapist's eyes, eyes were glazed and her face became sad. Oh, no, really, I said, Pat. It was rough at first, but I got over it. We all did. You have to. Shit, I never should have come here. I should have lied when she asked me about the family. I could have said 11. We could have talked about other stuff, like how doctors pay no attention to how sick I feel every single day. I couldn't wait to leave. What about the other two, she asked. I couldn't believe she wanted more. I knew I had to cut the rest short and get out, never to return. She looked like she was going to say, oh, you poor thing, which was always worse than when, pe than when people said, holy shit. Sympathy only made me feel embarrassed. The sympathizer are often looked unstable, not strong. How old were the others, she asked, regaining composure. Uh, well, Frankie was 22 and Kevin just turned 21. Fuck, should I pull the car or something? I'll just tell the truth and get it over. Frankie died first. He got involved in a bank heist. You know, Southie. I hesitated to realize that she and most people didn't know. He was found in the first getaway car, covered in trash bags and pushed on under his seat. He'd been shot in the crossfire. The detective said he could have lived if he was dropped off in a hospital or something. But, you know, I guess they thought he might have talked to them. Well, that's what the detectives told Ma anyway. I almost told her that Ma was now saying one detective told her Frankie was strangled to death in the back seat. I looked at the one finger I still had raised. Fuck, maybe after Kevin I can get to the fact that the sick dog. I need to find a good doctor. Then Kevin died after he did a jewelry store heist and went to prison. That stuff was much that stuff was much more Kevin's lifestyle than Frankie's. Frankie was a golden glove boxer and was much more into his body and lifting weights and stuff. Anyway, the detectives were working Kevin while he was in prison, trying to get information about the robbery that Frankie had died in. The detectives said they had a video that showed Kevin trying to stop, stop his partner from shooting the jeweler, and they were only going to show it in court if Kevin flipped. Word got out that Kevin was going to snitch for a lesser sentence. I felt it all spilling out of my mouth, but all I could think about it was the weight of my head. Long story short, I told her, he was found hanging in prison, outside his prison cell. Whether he did himself because he couldn't deal with the prospect of snitching, or someone else did because they couldn't deal with the prospect of snitching, he never did talk. Let me see, I said, still looking down, my head was feeling heavier. Kevin died. I had to stop count months on my fingers. Well, Frankie died in July, and Kevin died the following March. What's that? He died eight months apart? I raised my head to look at the therapist. She was buckled over in her chair, tears streaming down her face. Oh my god, no, really, it's not that bad, I said. This was all a long time ago. She got out her tissues and wiped her cheeks and asked, how long ago was it? About, once again, I had to stop and count. Well, Kevin died about three months ago, and Frank has been dead almost all year. <laughs> Walking through the Boston Commons in the subway, I couldn't get the therapist's tears out of my head. Even though so many Southie families have buried their kids in recent years, I thought for the first time, most people don't live like this. I saw that all the deaths in our family and in the neighborhood were not just normal. After my time with the therapist, I planned to stop at the National Hospital on the way home. If Dr. Reynolds could see that my head was lopsided and that I wasn't imagining the whole thing, he'd have to take me seriously for once. But by the time I got to Tremont Street, where I wouldn't turn left toward the hospital, I realized that my head wasn't so heavy anymore. Okay. Hi, Megan. That was great. Thanks very much. So we're gonna we're gonna move from South Boston to Durban Hill. Um, we have a highly esteemed guest here today. He's never been in this building. A long standing friend of mine who uh, was then reaching the local public bar for a long time. He, 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 uh, oh, that's not hard to shh, get to get to meet, get to meet, uh, can't hear. He, uh, Nerd is, is created in the fort, the old fort Jericho, where he first began to belt it an oasis tune or two back in the mid 80s. But then he found himself into the acoustic dance record. Go of us overall. The band is having each other, and then the crowd can make one thing about it. I'm serious. Too late. 
anybody want a twenty five <laughs> means? <laughs> oh Jesus Christ, we're not getting this year. Um, I have a girl. Sorry, so I'm not shaking out. Like, sorry, I don't know what to expect now. I don't know what I'm going to ask. Well, my name is Don Gregory, or Donald Gregory, or Casey Tom, or whatever you want to call me. I read songs about it. We're in real life. I had this whole fucking lofty, stupid speech. <laughs> Short drink for the night. About how you should speak with your own voice and all this here, but every single person who's been up here tonight has spoken with their own voice and talked about their own community and talked about where they came from. It's actually pretty amazing because nobody in Belfast does it. You know, I kind of considered unique, or at least it wasn't until I came here tonight. This is fucking hot water. It's the week. But, so I, Fergal met my ma the other, the other day, and uh, she's terrified that I'm here. <laughs> he says, well, it's alright, it's alright, as long as he doesn't sing out any controversial, which is going to be a fucking problem. <laughs> so, no, what I really do is, you know, we get all these rock stars, all these twats, and sing about fucking the money that they have in the car and trade, probably from the fucking mall. I was like, I'm going to be 40 next year. And I got a beer belly and a pits. So, I'm going to have stuff for me, so. I want to sing with stuff that relates to people in a real way. That's why I'm interested in folk music. Because it's about folk. It's people. Some of my songs, you know, that are 200 years old, and everybody still sings that day. Somebody just wrote it about his brother and all that stuff. So, anyway, I write songs about three things and it's stories about my life, and stories about other people's lives that I've seen, and things that I've thought about more than once in a week. So, where to go? I have a son, he's eight months old. And before he was born, I had a lot of conversations about what was going to happen. And that's this song's about. It's called When This Baby Comes. I also have a cold, so I'll have a Because he caught them right there. <laughs>
still do it because of the standard about, you know, sometimes you think about things, you know, because you should really write about what you know, no matter what type of writer you are. You should write about your life and other people's lives that you see, because it's far more interesting than anything else, really. It's fucking insane, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, um, so a while ago, I, was, I had two conversations, it was twice one week, so I had two conversations with a friend of mine. She started to realize, right there, like, you know, she would, you know, try and ball boss me or whatever, and I'd rip her head, verbally rip her head off, and I explained to her, like, you don't tell me what to do, I've heard all this shit. And then I started realizing, the more I let her tell me what to do, the better my life is, so... <laughs> 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 Man, he's mine, big dude, he's looking at another thing about dude. As long as it's not fucking enough case thing. But this song is called My Balls Are in Her Purse. <laughs> Because I have been fucked all week My balls are in her purse My balls are in her purse On a king of lake then This way I'm the top here I don't do well without a leash She controls my inner beast My balls are in her purse my balls are <laughs> when I do whatever I like, my leg quickly turns to shake. So I feel he falls away. I don't want them anyway. Yeah, it's been several weeks now, and I lost him my troll, and I wonder where he's gone. 
His task became all flabby in his absence. It'll be collapsed before it's been long. I think things get himself all sorted out, and his man makes to bed. But unfortunately, I would realize that I'm pretty sure my troll is dead. There's a troll under the bridge. There was a troll under the bridge. There was a troll under the bridge. Under well, the bridge. Sorry, no. There was a troll under the bridge. There was a troll under the bridge. There was a troll under the bridge. So under the bridge is where I live. Yeah, I bet you want to see a lot more trolls heading your way. Yeah, it says a two to one shot. You want to see more and more with every passing day. I think the hangar can turn or anywhere really with a shot from the rain. I just think I'm being you on a white sand blade trickle down the drain. There was a troll under the bridge. There was a troll under the bridge. There was a troll under the bridge. Under the bridge was where he lived. There was a troll under the bridge. There was a troll under the bridge. There was a troll under the bridge. Under the bridge was where he lived.
Let's get going. Let's get going. Okay, a card you. As you can see, if I'm done, it's very close to the knuckle. I can make kind of hurt myself in the wood stuff. I think it is it's amazing as well. And it's, uh, it's creativity. So if you've done enough whiskey, you make it back to your pal and do the work. Where's that pal? Do the work. That's pal. And Kid, and Kid, uh, and Kid's free glory, Alan, and the yeah. gold men are mad. We're going to go from Dermot Hill to Bottle Murphy here. We're going to John Boy, Sean, John Boy over again. Sean, John Boy over again, third Irish, an 18 year old. And since then, he's developed himself into one of the most proficient Irish players in the city. He also started to play in the long term of prison. And in recent times, he has developed into one of the foremost. Irish poets, poets, Irish language poets, and prose writers in the harsh. His recent book, Guy Red and Egg, was launched a few months back, and John Boy is going to come up and share some poetry and some of his prose. So, can I hit you with your bill of us with Sean? John Boy, Morgan. Yeah. I told him that you might come <laughs> But I also know that. I didn't make that. <laughs> Seriously? After <laughs> fucking. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I have learned though. Thank fuck I grew, grew up in Bala Market and Corp in the 1970s. Just 
she says that it wasn't her, but Jeremy who attracted her. He was a, she was promised to Ben. It was an old man. She didn't love him. This was the arrangement that she was married. Her father had arranged for the marriage, and she didn't love him. And then Jeremy walked in the room, and he was left. Yeah. And he flirted with her, and eventually he met her. And they were so ashamed that they ran away together. And then her uncle made the deal with them, the Fentacle, that they would let them be in the body. But Finn took the pain out of his one night, and um, there was a very famous boar that lived in the forest that had heard from the end of and that boar cut him and he died. And the boar was running towards where they were staying in the forest, and Jacobus gets cut by the boar. And he's going to die. But there was one thing that could save him. If Finn McCool could take water in his hand and feed the water in because of, he had a power to cure. And when he went to the water and he walked back up, he had held his fingers open. Got there, there was no water there, and Jim was dying. So it's not all fun about the big friendly gentleman. It wasn't the, the next nice guy, we <laughs> Okay, anyway, so this poem is uh, it's called Sad. <laughs> it's about the female in a patriarchal world. Sad. I know she is sad. She hides it behind the snag. Her sadness cannot be buried, only real. For him, a disquiet ignored is easily rude. Her woes do not make her unproductive. Like a stubborn daisy on the concrete, she mothers every single one of us. Yet she has no laurels on this story. She is sad, for she sees the invisible cage, while the other imagines captive with beauty. She does her ever mandatory march, ever behind him while she walks in front. As loud as she screams, it goes on heated, even when she cries inside and out, leaning down from his plinth to console her. He rubs salt from her tears into her eyes. He only knows obsequiously, while she hides her pain as weakness, denounced as the mistress of her own grief. She will be sad forever, and one day. <laughs> um, this is, the book is a book of short stories, but the short stories are really heavy. The one thing that about making order and sad, you know, really powerful things that happened in the world we lived in for a long time. But to try and lift a bit of that out of it, uh, there's a character in the book called Gobnish. And um, Gobnish is. Uh, Probably, she's an amalgamation of some women that I know, but she is a Belfast woman, and she's really strong, really fun. And uh, so these are just me. She's, she's like a philosopher, but in a very Belfast way, okay? So, I'll, I'll read some of them, and then I'll translate them in the English word to give you an idea of what she's doing. Mahar Gobnich. Be Mahar Gobnich or Kursch, if you love. Do you ever think Blanich again or Skull of Gobnich? Blanich is a lot of them. A water for Shishu. Do you frag her a hot tossed? Could you frag her a hot tossed? Not a leech in a jeep, a free free food, sir. Oh, dirty. Do you ever make a road to a jam of a mine? Well, you understand, Kursch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, her mother asks, 
How's your daughter? How's Blanage doing in school? And she said, Man, what did you say when people asked you about me? She said, oh, I always told them you were doing the same. She said, oh, well, I'll do it. Rohan, the government took us a car and we had all a cup of jockeys of wine. Now that I had got much, fire out, fire out, die you, and not here go back. Oh, we're shishing the shit car. To fire all in the gun. And she didn't fall. She didn't bring any money in that day of all of them. On the day of her heart, she gave us their teeth. A government should have seen. Now she looked to go to raw hand to get near her option. It's coming to get a hand on sit. I was next she didn't check in it. Government and her friend are in a bar and government sees a young man to get the monsters. Oh, here. I think I'm going to call them. And her mate goes, Thomas, do you not think you're a wee bit too old for him? She says, it doesn't matter what I think, as long as he doesn't. The government of a city or a tulip occurred five million to go in a blanage. Now, the key for the blanage, a warmie, can't roll him to the north. Oh, a story machine. Dole me an luel ar glun mo wahara. Ai tar o me lan wali. Tar glan ach ar glun. Ar dishtam is there? Well, o wami. Ti na bo te job a golden luel. Well, a hashti. Ash a golden ach. Bi ma bro al se jantan fyrin. O ar glun tu shen o wami. O a gram a kri pa ar glun ma ahara a dole me shen. So... Her do- she's sitting sewing her daughter's dress and the- her daughter says, What did you learn to sew? Oh, I learned to sew on my mommy's knee. Mm-hmm. Oh, why didn't you take up a job in the, s- the sewing game? Well, I was too lazy. Oh, what did you learn that? Well, I learned that on my daddy's knee. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> one more, that's it. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Right, so, Corey Foster. The government was planning to see a table, a cancer of Foster. Now, the door planned to lay it. But Bradham Chitchen and Rail of Fire Toy, I was in Sierra Kaidu Nikila, gone good and reached the job. Our government should have to hide the stuff of the church. A story in the dream. Now he's got him in a new trim. Talk and call it a hot car in a water in a room for of his mail, of his amateur. Of his assistant home. Now pots and fire of a grab of a door. A pots and fire of a grab in a ditch. The spectrum and fire shin a grab of a grab of his diary shed in the job. Her daughter asks, Tells her, ah, when I go, I want to get married, be a beautiful man, and, and have a wonderful life, life without any work. And uh, her mother says, oh, no, 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 don't be talking rubbish, Sherlock. Take the advice that my mother gave to me. So what was that? She says, not, do not marry the man you love, but marry the man that loves you. Because you can be a nuisance to him your whole life long, and you never need me.
on the lower syllable, but she composed it herself, and both of them relate to the Black Mountain, and both of them relate to the themes of Bella and Gideon Garma, and then she's, she's also going to share a page, she's going to lift the roof off, so Neve, start that. translates into English into the Mountain Man, which is about Miranda Harry and Red Senior, who was a community activist and an environmentalist in the Lafayette community. So, um, both of us are working for it. It's so to start, um, which is obviously the heartache of myself and family and the whole community when he died. But then it picks up a bit faster, and that's when all of us come together and um, do a bit more for the community um, because of the death. So.
someone or something in the troubles more recently. But um, again, let's just move on.
from Ramos then. Lawrence McGoon uh, did a late start in non case prison from 1976 to 1981. He also took part in the 1981 hunger strike. He was 71 days of hunger strike before being taken off the, the strike by his mother. He went on to be instrumental in the development of creative writing, political education while he was in prison. He also wrote a PhD on the history of Republican prisoners in long case under the Fenian Bastards, which was stolen from the, the, the Shannon he used to do song, which came out in, in around the same time. Lawrence's uh, PhD came out as a book out of time, released in 2001. He went on, he also remade a book, sorry, film, uh, History, which he wrote while he was in jail, and then he ended up being published. So he had a couple of pounds, this boy. Bill was a the So I should have said that Lawrence is going to read from his newly published. Poetry and Ballad of Reds, which contains some of the poems he wrote while he was in jail and other poems he has written since that time. So. Okay, Cormala, probably was the largest, or the other, or his, uh, Rodriguez McDonald has quite a round of them, up or five, uh, me, Brianna, I think we only just thousand and over, right here, 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 right Jarver, the uh, other DJ Crossbar, and Lee Scott, and Sean. Yeah. 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 Um, as far as I said, this is a book which was published before Christmas. I put all the writing that I have been doing started with poetry workshops back in 1988, which happened more by chance in the class as a way to pass out of the end of the week in the winter. But at least a real uh, glory of activity and creativity. And uh, that was in the later years, the following year, 1989, we. Uh, Established the magazine in Royal Gulfa, the Captain Voice, which continued for the next 10 years, felt until the prison closed. Uh, we're making sure my time, which is in there, all originally done clandestinely within the jail and the So, in a sense, uh, I was just one right to inspect this. Now, I had a number of poems that I just kept from the jail, and then when I was outside, something came to mind, would jot something down and had them. But uh, 18 months ago, I wrote to this woman, Jesse Lendelli, who wrote some poetry, because we wrote to her at the time, 19, way back in 1988, which was very helpful with some things. I said, a few poems here, you take a look and see what you think. I don't know, it's a set of more. It's not something that it does, and so I did that, and uh, heard nothing for the six months. Oh my God. <laughs> that's, that's how terrible they were. And then she wrote to say, look, that's uh, sorry, I just had a million and one things going on. Yeah, send me some more publishing. So, just want to read the uh, This is a, the, I think it's the first poem I ever wrote um, at a workshop, but it was the first one published. I was around the time where uh, the teapots here was where uh, Phil and Pablo had just started, and my uh, former partner, Gardner, Gardner McManus, was the director of it, and there was a great writing competition, and I uh, sent a poem out in one, and I don't think it's because Gardner was the director of it. was the director of it. Well, the poem itself, you know, it's, called, uh, it's called Hard Lines. Right angles and straight lines, they're everywhere. And I don't like their rigidity. All ceiling, floor, straight, sharp, cold, flippantly exact lines, meeting in right angles. The window has 20 right angles and straight lines. The door 4, 8 to count the spy holes. The grill 120. I've counted them. The canteen is full of them, tables, shelves, and benches of straight lines and right angles. Well, I want twisted, crooked lines, winding and curling, meandering paths, slopes, mounds, hollows, peaks, valleys, dips, curves of land and flesh. And I want them coloured, purple, blues, green, yellows, bright reds. No more black and white or grey uncertainty. And a different texture is true, please, if you don't mind. No more choice of rough or very rough. How about fine, soft, flurry, fluffy, smooth, satin, silk? Robotic minds, administrators, bureaucrats created this world of geometric precision. Did they think it beneath themselves to apply their engineering skills to the home of toilet bowl, the only work of prison art and anarchy? And 
prison in uh, August 1976, and then when there was a lot of paperwork were coming in, and uh, one of the guys that ended up next door to me was Kieran Dockery, the one with pickles and uh, the deep blood and all that. And, and Kieran Nugent was still in the wing um, before he got sentenced. And uh, this one's with Big Doc. Does um, anybody know him? He's like a very tall guy, very handsome guy, uh, really well built guy, very quiet, um, self effacing guy, very humble actually, but had, uh, had an amazing presence. And uh, I this was just we were, okay, we were young, we were only a couple of years younger than him, but anybody remembers him. Um, he had this walk coming to Pamphrey, he looked in the balls of his, of his feet. And like if anybody else tried to do it, it just looked silly. <laughs> but Doc could do it, he had this stand into these eyes that sort of just put a song to sit and the screws were either terrified of him or wanted to be picked up, one of his friends. So this is Kieran. Uh, yeah. As teenagers new to prison, your striking good looks were envied, your deceit admired, your confidence stepped. Something we could never imitate. In that strange and hostile world, your physical presence gave us security. Yet you were little more than a boy yourself, grown to non heterogeneity A short life, a schoolboy interrogation, or an act of service at the public home, gave way to your words, though few words you spoke. Your smile gave encouragement, a nod of your head, enough to prompt them plans. Even those who incarcerated you, admired you, wanted to be like you in their dream world. When I last saw you in the prison hospital in 81, only the shell of your body remained. Your movement slower, though just as definite. Your eyes clear as ever, and your voice soft as before. Confident, assured, Steady. Now arrive. Uh, now arrive comes from what Kieran said at the time about the reserve as well as negotiations going on and all the rest of it, what, uh, what they might mean or whatever, and uh, this thing will just continue. Now um, this is one which is written uh, outside of prison. Sorry, it's also a bit dark. There are funny ones in it as well. This is one which is a bit uh, funny. It was uh, some years ago I had a chance to go on a trip in the Balkans with all our artists and academics, uh, people in Croatia and Slovenia. And, 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 and we ended up uh, in Croatia visiting this, what was the site of a former uh, concentration camp during the Second World War. One was really not talked about, but again, tens of thousands of people killed them. Um, a lot of the five people who again who lived, lived beside each other. And it's called the Lost Crown of Croatia, as you'll understand in a moment. Let's call it. Uh, at Jasenovac, site of a World War II concentration camp, on the first day of Balkan's expedition, I lost my crown. Not the type of royalty where, but a tooth. <coughs> it happened during lunch, itself an incongruity, given the place where we sat with our picnic on a sunny day. There was a front tooth, prominent, noticeable by its absence, and vanity, vanity engulfed me. First day of expedition, 14 more to go, self-image, vanity. A lost crown at this, where many would have offered mouthfuls of teeth, a limb, an orifice, anything to escape their fate. Such thoughts banish quantity. The green fields of Jasenovic cover corpses, thousands of them, tens of thousands. But in the sunshine, the landscape dearth, they create a serenity, a stillness, an awareness of the past and what happened, in a way that gravestones could never achieve. I did see gravestones on expeditions of Balkans, in city parks where children should play, where older people sit and chat. But there's no space for that now. The dead have displaced the living. We talked about the dead in Jasenovic. They had names in a book. And photos too. 
We don't hear the names of others more recently killed in other cities in conflict. The bullet marked wall screamed sevens. Just do one more here. Um, Hold good order and just something. And it was about the. I was going to hear today, I mean, that suicide zone it was an uh, epidemic. It was this afternoon, it was probably most recent one up in this section of the whole time. Um, and this was written um, in prison. There was a young guy in our wings who wasn't, wasn't a political prisoner, but he came from a uh, political area community, so we, uh, we had him in the wings. And he was having some, some mental difficulties. And a lot of people to befriend them and make sure there's always someone close by to, to help them, etc. And uh, the prison authorities didn't want him to move on to the hospital, and people were dealing with him, they don't be moving him up because he's going to be isolated, he's going to have to uh, be on his own. And uh, what they didn't, he did, they took him to, uh, they took him to the hospital and uh, he got himself that evening. So it's called good order and discipline. They say an inquiry will be held by the governor and the RUC. And there's no doubt it will be handled meticulously. And attention will be given to such detail as the exact time of death, and where precisely they stood or sat, those who were caring for him. And they will inquire as to the type of rope used or how it was fastened, or who it was found him swinging or hanging limply, as is a more apt description, of a body that has lost its life and was dying at the end of the rope. And reports will be written and signatures affixed to the bottom of countless forms. On the computer, his name, age, occupation, and political sympathies will now be followed with died August 11th, 1988. Because the attention they devote to him today will be no less than that given to him yesterday, when they ensured that he had a bed to sleep in and clothes to wear and food to eat. And we must be honest and say that they were attentive to those needs. Just as they were attentive to the pitiless enforcement of their rules and regulations, which demand that the prisoner will battle for every concession or privilege, and that when he has seemed to bend or buckle under unknown and untold sorrows, he will have more weight added to his burden, starved of companionship, moved around so as to be the responsibility of no one, so that no one can be blamed for the inevitable outcome of a process geared towards. Good order and discipline. Persons with names and histories become bodies with numbers, become statistics with eyes. Robots don't cry, it's much tighter that way. Put up.
that's the next one's about growing up in these streets. So, mm -hmm. I'm from Ireland, and anyway, I've just moved up in the Washington recently, so... Oh, that's a problem. Oh, that's a problem. So, young Dom, full of scum, called his dad, called his mum, growing up on these streets, we were young pretenders. Young scum kicked his bomb, where the fuck they get him from? Growing up on these streets, we were young offenders. We thought we knew it all, we thought we had it all. Looking back, we were so small. Little rabbits in a box, little pigs in a cage. Big bad wolves everywhere with so much rage. It's time to turn the other page, it's time to seek your inner seeds. It's time for us to blow it down, blow it down. Dirty deeds all around, dirty wars from the crown, dirty deeds all around, dirty wars, all these clowns telling us what to do, telling us what to know, yet the stupid shit they show. People learn from example, give them truth and keep it up. People learn from example, give them things that make them strong, let them know that they belong. Growing up on these streets, we were young pretenders. Growing up on these streets, we were young offenders. Now all the stupid politics is full of raving lunatics, fucking with their class laws, brass necks, fuck facts, more tax. Living off the people's backs, relax you, you get your brood. Fuck you, let's stand and play our part, let's do it from the heart. No more living in this cage, break the box that your raids sing. Dance, paint and draw, hit them with your onslaught. You can do it, so can I, there's no limit, there's no scale. <laughs> So, 
Connor McShakey, also known by his alias Jake Mack, has been writing his own songs and he also has worked here in the area. He's born out of this place here and he's going to share some of his creativity with us today. Jake Mack.
when they teach us reason. Basically, I've done this something more than one about three weeks ago, or maybe about, about six weeks ago. And um, I've done the I've done the, the Christy Moore version of the song, so I'm going to try and have a crack at my own version of it. Thank you. 
Said the hermit settle down and get a few acres flow. With the fire burning on the hearth, the body's on the road. She said, I'm not going to waste my time. Sure, you sound like a devil. Well, you might be Lord of half the world, but you're not so weird. Nobody, <laughs> 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 
of the BLM. <laughs> what's, what's incredible about this place and the reason that Stephen belongs in this place is that this place, more than any other place on this island, and Stephen is among the people on this island who challenges the master narratives and also challenges uh, the kind of ongoing narrative that tells people that they need to hang themselves. You know what I mean? Um, we're in an ongoing struggle here between people who are taking those orders and people who are refusing those orders. And a lot of what we saw tonight is the voices of people who are refusing those orders. This is the antithesis of going that route. It really is. Having voice, having agency, and turning your voice and agency into leadership, turning it into activism, organizing. Stephen embodies a lot of the values of this place. The values around the indigenous, the values around landscape, the role of storytelling, and so forth. And that's all I'll say. And so a big Belfast welcome home. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think I might just go home. Alan, we do that. Some Belfast car. Yeah, my name is Stephen, and I'm going back. Yeah, it's 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 an honor to be here, and thanks to Virgil, and thanks to me for, for yeah for, for having me along. I'd just like to refute the headline that uh, element. Of that. It's, been, it's been an incredible evening. But what I've seen is the community. It's not about hierarchy. It's about community. It's about people coming together as equals. And I think until such time as we do that as an island and probably as a world, to be honest, um, everything's just going to remain the same as it is. about what's wrong and what's right. But see, I've known you a long time now and I've analysed you closely. In this life that you've been living is a parasitic parody that feeds upon the blood of self-fulfilling tragedy. For days and weeks and months and years of fake familiarity, but never are your boundaries push to be the best that self can be. Just don't turn around in years from now and say that you remember me when all you've ever seen me as is lucid domesticity and only in your darkest moments look to find the light in me. Look, I'm not trying to sound harsh. I'm just speaking my mind. I'd be everything you are if I knew how to lie. You see, the world is my life, man. And if you ask me to die, I'd push back my gears and I'd be like, you can die. But I've watched and loved, watched and hated, watched and infiltrated hate with love as easy as innocence is obliterated. I have heard you screaming out the names whose overdose of pleasure brought you pain, and I have listened. As patiently as the wives of war victims pacing hospital corridors listened to the horrors that man brings upon man. 
It's still run with the cat. Because <laughs> <laughs> he looks after himself. <coughs> Steals ham off the table and cheese off the shelf. There's no codependence, it's each their own if you're worth it apart. He just lick his own hole. <laughs> <laughs> I just think you should know. He's been plotting your death ever since that last little faded trip to the vet. So looks her this evening, he's completely insane. He's got no sense of reason and he's numbered your days. You see, sometimes I wish I could talk or bring you for a walk in the lead so you can see how it feels to be me. Because if I could talk, I too would blame astrology or religious ideologies or pharmaceutical dichotomies for all that might be wrong with me when in reality I'm an animal. Who was born and who will die happy in the knowledge that I have lived and loved my time. So if you get this, and I hope you do, I just wanted you to know that I'm sorry about your shoe. <laughs> but don't be worrying about me. There's no need to reply. You just talk a bit louder and I'll be here. Oh, yes, son. Wow. The, um, I don't know how I'm going to follow the build up from Nick there, but. Give it a bit. Yeah, yeah, should we give it a lash and see how we get on? You know, we're, we're amongst friends. But um, he, mentioned, uh, he mentioned a poem that I lashed out in. Um, Probably about 2014, and I started writing at the week and found out I was going to become a father. I went on to become a piece, a poem called Was It For This? And it's brought me to some incredible stages over the years and some very surreal experiences for a country boy from Leitrim and from a village of about 80 people to stages of 50, 100,000 people, all sorts of crazy stuff that will never really sink in. But in, um, when I put it up, I, I put it up because my uncle was only after being born. Uh, he was a couple of weeks old and he was a sleeper outside the barn in Lincoln in the car. And uh, thankfully, in the car, not just in a bunch of nettles or something. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I put it up because I was like, okay, I'm not going to be gigging for a while. I'll just throw it up there. Maybe 100 people might watch it or something. And anyway, I went to bed and woke up the next day and I got a message from somebody saying, You made Jerry cry. And I was like, Oh, but bollocks, what am I after you and now? Right? <laughs> Jerry's my dad's name. So I was like, Oh, I <laughs> I'm 30 now, I, kind of, I was hoping I'd stop doing that for a while. And he sent me on a link to Jerry Adams' Twitter feed. <laughs> <laughs> See what it makes me cry. And I'm, like, I'm not sure that's a good thing or a bad thing. You know? <laughs> but, um, and anyway, but yeah, this, this piece is, um, in this moment, the piece called Was It For This? And I dedicate it to anyone who hasn't given up on this island. And sometimes that's easier said than <laughs> done. But um, yeah, it goes like this. I pace a lot, you know, you know, I just kind of walk around the room for a while. But, um, has anyone a Fitbit? I'll give them 10 <laughs> But anyway, it goes like this. Was it for this? The pagan strove with woven baskets born of blood. The worship at the altar of the harvest god crumbled. blood. As the sun rose up the reek and then set down the other side to summon pilgrims to its peak to come from far and wide before the Christians came to Ireland and proceeded to rename it Crook Patrick. As it stands today, will proudly they proclaim it as a place of modern pilgrimage and not the site of ancient heritage that history forgot. Was it for this? The druid stood before the old gods of the trees and found in schools within their robes to learn the mysteries that lay buried in the branches and encoded in the leaves as the language of the earth written there for all to see. Was this why they came between the people and the great divine and shed the blood of mortal flesh to prophesy through time? Was this the future they once saw? Was it this they had in mind when they foretold in days of old what's born can never die? Was it for the only empire in Rome that still exists. To confiscate our island, though some would still insist that we were never conquered, that somehow we escaped in spite of all the plundered land and the children that were raped. Was it the rules they teach in schools they claim are set in stone? 
that have rendered us like lambs to collapse and left alone, that now bring us back in droves to, to a church that we've outgrown, but are scared to leave or to believe we're better on our own. Was it for the famine? For the Irish Holocaust? I was rarely thus examined, but in truth the human cost was inflicted on this island by the British, and yet peace is supposed to be some pure and noble diplomatic feat. But Mandela fought for what is right and was called a terrorist. By the same people who in death had claimed his right to coexist was never left in any doubt nor disputed in the slightest because the darkest stars that ever were in death will shine the brightest. Was it for Biffle? Sight in Lisbon as the only show in town inviting Europeans to kick us while we're down, inciting fear amongst the people in need of some relief from the systematic slaughter of a nation's self-belief as if we're drum and bow in Anglo, picking figures from their arse, singing Nazi anthems to elucidate the farce of both the major parties, being a gale and being a fall for pretending key decisions are still made within the doll, was it for this? Some keepers of the peace have forgotten the translation of Angola Shiakon, or was it infiltration that has set the force upon the course of rampant racketeering at the expense of innocence for private profiteering Well, the greatest crime there's ever been on this island is ongoing as the IMF still strip us clean and bear despite her knowing yet their crimes are somehow normalised and accepted as deserved by the dogs within our government and the masters that they serve. Was it for the US flights? <clears throat> of extraordinary rendition. Stopping off at Shannon on the way to their perdition. As if it's nothing more than a casual decision to be complicit in the torturing of innocent civilians, but instead of pushing peace, we imprison the protesters and determine their release at the whim of the investors who have bought and sold this island for the promises of oil. In pipes they plan on laying on what once was farm and soil, but the cows are gone. And the people are gone. And the farms are left to fail. Now they probe the seas for oil and gas, the lakes and land for shale, will the sycophants and the psychopaths clap backs within the pale with the numbness and the bonus for the speedy fire sale of our water and electric that can folk be ours for free with a slight recalculation of our own priorities if instead of paying billions for a debt we never owed, we invested in renewables and let the future flow. Was it for the lattes? With chibatas and goat's cheese. <laughs> for the double maca frappes called the quits and skinny jeans. For the oh my god, that fuck my life, say you don't understand the like you knows, the BFFs, that let's make dinner plans. Was it really for the hipsters? Why are they just a glitch? In the evolutionary motherboard, a momentary twitch that normally exists in every generation but is usually ignored by righteous indignation, was it for this? The proclamation was read out upon the steps for this fire defamation that that bell end Bertie left to cast shadows over bullet holes and pillars that remain standing by the GPO where the volunteers were slain for this the Fina marched across the mountains and the bogs for this we killed each other for the right to label gods for this we raised our children just to watch them up and leave as another generation, educated and deceived. Or was it for the moment we have finally realised that all that really matters is what's right before your eyes? The simple understanding to come whatever else, you'll never know another as you learn to know yourself. And even though we come to love with everything we are, the truth is every one of us has once been battle scared. And the purest love that still remains is written in that kiss before we fall asleep at night that says, 
it was the best. Three lies and then a spirit. 
while men must be a slave by thus reply. For money is a god, and we should fear it. And folly is the principle of pride. The chalice split apart in tiny fragments and scattered in its shards across the board. But any laughed and said of his enjoyment. Now watch and see how soon that it's restored. The hares will pick their footing on the rushes. The land will always journey to the sea. But there amongst the rocks and in the bushes will be the old dominion of the sheep. The pieces rose and took their rightful places as perfect and as precious as before, and shone out as the truth upon the faces of Mononon and I again once more. Let all who would seek answers in the sky, Lord, but none unto its questions be enslaved, and waking find the gods that live inside us, as I was born in Bolus, and let Bolus be my grave. The wind drew in from out across the west, and it came with heavy-handed bands of rain that brought a sudden end upon my rest and took me to awaken the stake again, where two hairs upon the rushes were staring back at me, and I swear amongst those ancient stones I heard the sacred footsteps of the sheep. Sessions is pulling the old myths back into the modern day and kind of playing with them because I think it's in the midst that we find the stories and we find, in a sense, the healing. I'm going to talk about the meanwhile, but then the, the stories are already there. All, all we have to do is kind of reawaken the old energies again in, in so many respects. I'm going to do one of the things that I've heard a lot touched upon tonight has been the idea, has been the idea of suicide and the epidemic of suicide that's. Discouraged, probably not only on this island to be honest, but off the, off the world. And um, it's mental health has kind of become a kind of false term or whatever. And uh, it's, 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 not, it's not mental health that's killing people, the societal illness that's actually killing people. That's always been on the way to you, which might be sorry. <laughs> the, um, but it is, it's, it's, it's not, if you want people to be, if you want people to be mentally healthy, build a society that caters. Build a community that can be a part of them, that you can feel a part of them and watch them thrive. It's not it's not fucking rocket science. It's very it's very straightforward, excuse my language, but yeah, this idea of mental health has turned into just another industry that people want to profit off. And uh, and it may, maybe I'm wrong in that, maybe that's just my own my own thinking. But I sent this poem on to every single mental health organization and charity in the country that I could think of, and every single one of them stonewalled them. And it wasn't until last summer that a friend of mine recorded it in Pub and Perry and put it out there to a few different places that people picked up on it. And this, I don't know what there is on it. There's a couple of million views that you can't eat on it now on, online or whatever. But um, it's still nice that it resonates with people and people have been in touch with me and about this poem. But anyway, sorry for the preamble. Um, my head's a bit scattered these days. It's a poem called Before You Push the Chair. And it goes like this. I'm sorry for, for you know, lower the tone, maybe, but anyway. I want you to know that I've been there. Did I ask that you don't record it? Sorry. Thanks. I'm sorry. Bro. Sorry. Anything <laughs> else? I want you to know that I've been there. In those moments when it feels as though every wall is a prison and the whole world kneels upon you and the darkness of your vision has encompassed all before you and turned your whole world black and it feels as though you'll never get to see your whole world back and I've been neighbored with depression and branded with disease and given the impression that for anyone who sees past this great deception that's been sold to us as fact is attempted for expression as to how we should react. But have come to see despair as a product of control that's embedded in our psyche by the forces we patrol, what we read within our papers or see upon our screens as deliberately tapered to tamper with our dreams. And for all that we resisted and stare on every surface, 
From our buses to our bodies, all designed to fit the purpose to remind us that for all we have, it's still never enough. That there'll always be that void to fill with other mindless stuff. And though some still cling to God, bring some structure to their lives, and others seem to need to be destructive to survive, there's a whole new generation. Wandering aimless and confused, they were born into an age that never had a God to lose, and in their quest for validation, they turned to the machine. Because they've come to know the world through the comfort of a screen. And I've seen the way we've gone from being socially inept, from the people who were strong to being totally inept, where anxiety and loneliness are living side by side, and everyone's just saving face for fear of losing pride as the constant threat of homelessness and risk of repossession has come to manifest itself as clinical depression. So we medicate the masses just to keep them from the rope and eradicate the last remaining evidence of hope just to sell us back the superficial versions of ourselves from the sacrificial altars of our supermarket shelves. And then tell us that a problem halved is just a problem shared, but thus a problem doubled is a problem that's been there because so many now it's there because, to paraphrase Voltaire, they see who rules, who suffers, yet still a woman scared. But before you push the chair, I want you to step down from there and be the light you're born to be. To understand that those who see things differently are those who reshape history. That the prophets and the scriptures and the poets of the times and everyone you've ever met has struggled with the mind, but one true friend will always trump a million friends online where reality is distorted and contorted to obscure and designed to isolate us and to make us insecure, but for all our social networks. Our net worth is obsolete when we need the praise of strangers to make us feel complete. But beyond our echo chambers, when we lift our eyes, we'll see that around us lie the embers of our own humanity, and as day is why we name the night, so too we'll come to see that the day we like to blame in life is only ever we, and for all, we try to justify the versions of our truth, there will always be perversions to another's absolute. Because no matter where the roots lie, the one thing guaranteed is that the plant will always come to bear the hallmarks of the seed. <coughs> and look, I don't have all the answers, and I'll never say it again. With just as many doubts and insecurities as you, but a friend of mine once told me that I showed up in a dream, and I'm not exactly sure what any of it means, but I was walking through a desert with my back towards the sun in a crowd of other people, but for every other one, their shadows fell before them, but for me, it fell behind. And he said that he just stood there and watched us for a time. And at last, I took an hourglass and smashed it with a stone and poured the sand upon the sand as there I stood alone. And when he asked me why I did it, I turned to him and said, well, that was simply just the way that the universe was made. And I know it may sound cliché, but I've been thinking about it since. And the more that I've been thinking, the more that I'm convinced that maybe all of us are only pouring dust upon the dust, and it's not us killing time, but more just time that's killing us. But when two people, every day here now, are taking their own lives, and countless many others are struggling to survive, at what point do we acknowledge that this problem's epidemic, and not just a polemic of some college academic, because we're so intent on carrying this intense collective grief that we seem content of marrying a lack of self-belief to a greater sense of victimhood that always comes across as a symptom of the dogma we've adopted from the cross. Well, look, I'm tired of trying to find the words. I'm sorry for your loss. And that loss could be avoided for a fraction of the cost. And I'm tired of the statistics, because the numbers can't uphold the stories of the victims that will largely go untold, and I'm tired of the stigma that still surrounds our mental health, as if we're simply feeling is a failing of the self. But I'm mostly just exhausted, because I'm all too well aware of it. And right now, someone else is just about to push the chair. And I wish that I could tell them 
for however dark their plight, and through the shelter of each other, we can learn that love is light. Actually, um, my uncle turns five. Well, he turns five next week, but his birthday party was on Saturday, so I have to, I, I'm in Cal in the morning and I'm back to Limerick. Um, yeah, I'm back to Limerick on Saturday for, for his party, so it's, it's a short one. But anybody with any kids might recognize my, my resume with him and say, it's called, it's, it's called Rowan. My, I need, we call him Rowan because the Rowan tree was in bloom when the day he was born, but um. But also, it's, it's been rebranded as son of your newborn baby. And then um, it goes like this in here. Yeah, it's only short, but you'd like it to hear. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes poems just write themselves. This one landed on the day he was born, which is kind of. Oh, one of those in here. Um, I call it Poet Queen because it's much nicer than any of the rest of the stuff. If I can tell you anything and think you'd understand, I tell you that in all the years I've grown to be a man, I've never known a greater sign of God's omnipotence, nor a single moment in my life that made such perfect sense as the second, when I held you for the first time in my palm. Your body pressed against my chest, your precious little hand that curled itself around my tongue and thought me more right then than any hope has ever done in life ever again. But I might never tell you this, because sometimes words can't show the full extent of all there is between us as we grow. But know this, when you need me, I will be where you will be, to help you in your journey from a sapling to a tree. And there within the forest, as your roots grow strong in I will guide you anyway and protect you as you see. Yeah. I'm conscious it's not getting any earlier as well, so everyone's wrecked and everyone probably wrecked. So I'm going to leave you with this one then. I, I, I'm the worst businessman in the world, but I have a few books and CDs out there that would be interested. And if not, I'll well, generally be smoking around and probably drinking some whiskey and wine. But, yeah, um, I would say again, yeah, thanks to everyone, thanks to thanks to everyone involved in putting this on, thanks for having me I, as, as a partner. It's, it's really, it's an honour to be here to see you. And I thank everybody who got up as well and did the thing. And, yeah, it's, it's lovely, it's lovely to be, you can, you can be, you can be on stage in front of me. It doesn't matter how many people you know, and after a while it just becomes a blur, right? And it's much, it's always a much nicer environment to be, to be in a room with the, with the community, with the, with the sense of community, with the sense of understanding that people can cultivate together, rather than standing in some, some other field looking at everything. <laughs> Cats in the moment of the years. 
But anyway, it goes like this. It's called, and uh, thanks me for listening again, folks. Cheers. Yeah, it's a good story. Thanks for the note. It's called a, a letter from the Right Honourable Cat <laughs> <laughs> to his lowliness, man. It has come to my attention through my network of connections that my character has been likened to a mix of predilections from the finer things in life, such as the glory of myself, to a murderous and intent in this scant regard for health. And although it was some time ago, I feel that it's incumbent to reply to it in kind and thus to render it redundant, for to let such matters slide as I'm sure you'd understand, would be damning for self pride and a disaster for my brand. And I try my level best to be upstanding and magnanimous, but I ran it past my ethics and the findings were unanimous that the true obsessive creature that's been posing as your dog is a sycophantic creature that's mistook you for a god. <laughs> <laughs> and when I expect such adoration must be flattering at worst, I reject such assertions as both pandering and perverse, and I hope you're not insulted for my intentions not to scorn, but I simply can't believe that you're a deity reborn. Because <laughs> all of this... <laughs> is demeaning and base. Compared to the sheer volumes of the problems that I've faced as you lie asleep and dreaming in the comfort of your bed, will I roam the furthest reaches of our neighbourhood instead. For I too have no new years now, though at times it has been strained. By your failings as a person, I have faithfully remained, accepting no embarrassed of your wish to call me pet, though I stand behind my fundamental loathing of the bed. For although I may be partial, to licking my own arsehole, and I may have sworn to slay you for that all too faithful day who took me to that psychopath and cut my tomlin off, I contend my poor reactions were distinctly fair enough. Because I'd like to see how you would, you would be should such roles be reversed, and suspect you may respond in a manner somehow worse than the night who threat to kill you that was little but a sound that was blown out of all proportion by that flea infested hand. <laughs> <laughs> But my reasoning for writing this is not just a chastiser. I could, of course, find ample room with which to criticise her. I could tell you of the time that she spent laying on your bed after bathing in the mucky swamp behind the slatted shed, but to do so would degrade myself. So suffice it is to say that we are all prone to our weaknesses, though I keep mine at bay. Now my reasoning for writing into a pardon and digression is to tell you as I must that I have my own confession. You see, I've counted out the lives that I have used to get here. And so far I make it eight, and as such it would appear that my time now as a mortal is resigned to that of fate, and I wanted to reach out to you before it is too late. For although I may be liberal with pointing out your flaws, and testing out the fabric on your couches with my claws, I love you nonetheless, dear man, I leave you now at that, and remain your once neurotic, now content and flattened. <laughs> Thank you. I want to get Stephen Murphy and Will Lasella. Fantastic. So, that brings an end to the formal proceedings of the night. We've just did a good solid three hours there. So, I want to thank you for your, your patience. I hope you've enjoyed it. Tony McCatcher has fallen asleep here. He came from Mio and Al. He's important. But before, before some of our of our contributors leave, I'm looking at Callum and Jake and others. We'll have the interview unarmed, unarmed with Tony uh, before you go. We have some whiskey and wine if people want to have out for a way. And we have the Dale and Gang Army program, which is, which is contained. We'll have the program here, which is contained. With his, we invite this all to our. Uh, long table lunch for policy on Saturday between 2 and 4 in here. Uh, there's a guy called Anna O'Carlin who's coming up and building a community gym in the West Bank and he's fundraising for it and we're going to ask for donations. People are going to bring some food. If any is a part of your shelves, it's a button cook, you can bring something along. And it's going to be here on Saturday between 12 and 2. And that evening we'll see it at the fail of a bag of tail. We're going to be coming in in Chimney Lodge. A car check for a bit of money.